Do you ever wake up with that feeling like you just want to do a GRE practice test? Well, I kind of woke up like that today and I decided that as a slight break from the McGraw-Hill tests that I've been doing, I would do the Magoosh free online test. Now, I've never seen or done this test before, but Magoosh is a reputable provider of GRE materials, so it's almost certainly going to be a really good one. Now, what I thought would be best for your learning is that if I do the test as if I'm doing it myself for real, so under timed conditions, but I will try my best to add in as much teaching as I can along the way as time allows. I've got my little notepad here and I also have a calculator handy. I also know, by the way, that Magoosh is quite famous for having some harder level questions. So if you're one of those people who thinks the test's gotten a lot harder recently, this could be the one for you. Feel free as ever to do the test along with me. That would be great actually. But I can't wait any longer. I want to start. So I'm going to set the clock here for 35 minutes and I'm going to get started. So let's go. Question one, circle A has radius X, circle B has diameter two X. Thing is, diameter 2x means the radius is x, so it's the same circle. Just check I haven't missed anything, it's the same, same radius, so it must be the same circle. So the circumference to diameter ratio of circle A, circumference to diameter ratio of circle B, but it's the same circle. So I don't need to calculate the ratio or the circumference, just the same circle. So both quantities are equal. Next. Choose the correct statement. W plus X plus Y equals 21, the average of X and Y. Well, we don't know because we don't know W. W could be like 21, making X and Y zero, or W could be like one, making X plus Y 20. So we don't know. We don't know which is bigger because we don't know anything about W. So D. You want to go this fast to save time for the harder questions. A number X is randomly selected from the integers 92 to, uh, 42 to 92 inclusive. The probability that X is odd, the probability that X is even. Well, I don't need to count it up because it's starting off at an even number, 42, and ending with an even number, 92. So there's going to be one more even number than odd number because we started on an even and ended on an even. If it started on an even, ended in odd, it would be equal but now there's gonna be more evens. So again, I didn't need to work it out. I could just get the answer straight. The sales tax at a certain store is 15%. The total price of an item including the sales tax is 45. What is the price of the item excluding the sales tax? You do not take 15% off and then find the item. That would be a big mistake. Sales tax of 15% means multiplied by 1.15. Obviously, I can't fully explain that. So to get back to the original price, we divide by 1.15. I've done many videos on percentages for you to check out. So the original price was 39.13, and then times that by 1.15, and you get 45. So A is slightly higher. 39.13, yes, slightly higher than B. Just check if I missed anything. Always be paranoid. Definitely always be paranoid. Yeah, happy with that. Choose the correct statement. Y or the absolute value of Y is between three and seven. So Y is gonna be between three and seven or minus three and minus seven. Y squared plus five. So the squared means that the absolute value is irrelevant. Whether it's a negative or it's a positive, it's between three and seven because we're squaring it. And so it didn't matter if it was minus three or minus seven. Anyway, the smallest it can be is 14. Because remember, we treat the limit of three, even though technically it's not allowed to be three. So smallest is three squared, which is nine plus five, 14. The biggest would be 49, seven squared plus five, 54. So somewhere between and excluding 14 to 54, meaning it could be bigger than 50 or less than 50. So we don't know. When car S covered a distance of D on a track, it covered 25% more distance than car T had covered. It's complicated, so let's reread it. When car S covered a distance of D on a track, it covered 25% more distance than car T had covered. 
Right, so the trick here is they want you to make the mistake of taking away 25% like we would have done in the other question, and then it's 0.75D, but that's not how you do it. Remember, how do you undo 25% more? We divide by 1.25. So actually, one divided by 1.25. I kind of already know the answer, but I'm kind of demonstrating it to you. It's 0.8 again, so it's gonna be the same. Car T is 0.8D, column B is 0.8D. Because if you think about it, just to prove that, if it's 25% more, let's do the 0.8 times 1.25, because it's 25% more, and we get to 1D, proving that that is what car S had done. So don't take away 25% to undo a 25% increase. The way to undo a 25% increase is to divide by 1.25. I've done a video on reverse percentages, so do check it out. Both quantities equal. Obviously I'm going fairly fast, so there's a tiny possibility of mistakes, but let's keep going. Choose the correct statement. Events A and B are independent. By the way, if you're wondering about the question seven of 40, it's because there is quant and verbal in here, so it's just gonna be 20 quant questions. Events A and B are independent. The probability that they both occur, so A times B, remember when they're independent events, the probability that they both occur is A times B, which is only true when they're independent events, is 0.6. So A times B is 0.6. The probability that event A occurs and 0.3. It's almost like X times Y is 0.6 because both of them occurring is 0.6. We couldn't work out X from that, which is event A. Like X could be 0.8 and Y could be something high. No, now I think about it, if we try numbers, then it always has to be higher than 0.6 because if x is something lower, sorry, always higher than 0.3. If x is something lower than 0.3, which is what we're comparing it to, right? We're comparing it to column B, which is 0.3. So first of all, I'm saying we don't know what x is. We're all agreed here, we don't know what x is, but we might know that it's bigger than 0.3, which is column B. How do we know it's bigger? Because if we make it less, if we pick numbers, try numbers, try something like 0.2, you can't times 0.2 by anything to get to 0.6. You'd have to times it by three, but a probability can't be three. So even though we don't know what X is, we know it's something higher than 0.6. We know it has to be something like 0.8 times another high number, like, I don't know, I can't do the maths in my head, but 0.75, I think it is, or something like that, to get to 0.6. So all the numbers that we're trying for X, which is event A, are gonna be higher than 0.3. Even though we don't know what X is, it could be 0.9, it could be 0.8, it could be 0.7, it could even be 0.6 and then Y is one. All of these numbers, they have to be higher than 0.6 because Y is capped at one because a probability can't be higher than one. Therefore, it's definitely bigger than column B, which is 0.3. Not a full explanation, but again, I've got to watch the time a little bit. A certain company has 200 employees, all of whom are either programmers or marketeers. All of whom, so there's none in neither. Of these, 20% of the programmers own pets and 23% of the marketers own pets. Definite tree diagram question for me. So we've got 200 and they're split up between programmers and marketeers. And then we have 20% of the programmers, so 0.2p own pets, and therefore 0.8 do not own pets. No pets. Probe. This is pets and no pets. Obviously I'm rushing the diagram a little bit. 23%, 0.23. Okay, and 0.77 for no pets. Check that there, 20% own pets. And yeah, and pets. Number of employees who own pets. Ah, right. Okay, so I did the tree diagram, which actually turned out to be not helpful here. The reason being is I didn't see that column A and column B, they're not actually asking you to work it out. They don't tell you any further information. 
To use a tree diagram, I'd have to know some extra stuff, like maybe how many programmers there are. But I can't actually solve it with this. All I can tell you is that it's a quantity comparison question. And we don't know, if you look at 43, 43 is an interesting number. Notice we can't work out the number of employees who own pets. It's a bit like the last question, because we don't know how many programmers there are and how many marketeers there are. So that's why the tree diagram won't help. But 43, which is what we're comparing it to, we can work out 43 out of 200, that would be 21.5%. So if 21.5% overall own pets, it would be equal to column B. But we don't know if 21% or 21.5% own pets. It depends how many are programmers, how many marketeers. If it was equal numbers, halfway between 20 and 23 would be 21.5. So it would be both quantities equal. But it didn't say that there's an equal number of programmers and marketeers. It might be more programmers, in which case it's closer to 20%, or more marketeers, in which case it's closer to 23%. If you're not sure about this, check out my video on uh, weighted averages, which covers the trick I'm using here to save time. Turned out true diagram wasn't helpful, but there we go. Anyway, I'm using a lot of time to teach here, but hopefully you find it valuable. Choose the option that best answers the question. Ooh, if a k minus b equals c minus d k, then k equals what? So we're going to have to, it's a classic rearranging question. Let's show off some algebra skills here. You guys can do that too at home or wherever you are. So we want to isolate the k, which means bringing all the k's to one side. So we bring the k's across to join its friend on this side, and we push the b across. So notice this brings both k's to the same side of the equation. Now we factor out the k, because that's the only way to isolate the k, is to factor it. If you don't factor it, you can't isolate it, and then divide by the bracket. So this is classic algebraic rearrangement, giving us b plus c over a plus d, which is answer e. I don't need to check that because it was so definitive. And I need to save time for the harder questions. Although these have been fairly hard. In a certain sequence of numbers, each term after the first is found by adding one to the previous term and then doubling the sum. If the third term is 18, which of the following numbers are in the sequence? So let's start off by going backwards in the sequence. If we have 18 in the sequence, well then, to go backwards, we have to think about how we went forwards. We went forwards by adding one and then doubling. So we're going to go backwards by halving and then taking away one. So that's nine, take away one equals eight. So eight is in the sequence. We go backwards again by halving and then taking away one. So that's four minus one, three. So three is in the sequence. So we've run out of going backwards now. We've gone as far back as we can. Now we go forwards. So we're at 18. So now we add one and double it because now we're going forwards. 19 doubled is 38. So that's going to be the last one because it's going to get a lot bigger. So we went forwards and backwards. I've done a sequences video, check it out. 11 of 40, okay, what is the value of W in terms of X and Y? What is the value of W in terms of X and Y? Interesting, hmm. Think about this one. We've got now, there's nothing about parallel here, so we can't use that trick. Interesting, interesting. So what I'm going to do is, you see W is in this bottom right-hand triangle. I'm going to try and fill out as many terms of that triangle as, we, as I can. So I'm going to start off with the bottom right angle. I, can't re I don't really have time to draw a full diagram. So I'm just gonna, I'm focusing on that bottom right triangle if you can visualize it. Okay, well, <laughs> terrible diagram, but anyway. See, we've got X at the top and a Y in the bottom left. Oh, this is so terrible, I'm just gonna draw another one so you guys can at least understand what I'm doing. In the real test, I wouldn't actually be drawing this diagram, but I'm just doing it for you guys. That's how good of a guy I am. W, X, Y. Okay, so focusing on this angle here, well, notice the big overall triangle has an X at the top and a Y down here. So this last one is going to be 180 minus 
x plus y. Okay, because we'd add up x and y and then take that away from 180 and that'll get you this angle. This angle here is the same thing, right? Because we have a flat line. So we have x, y, and then a leftover bit. So we do 180 minus x plus y. Notice I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just doing as much as I can to find out w. And then finally, it would be w minus these two angles that I've just worked out. And that would give me the 180. Or sorry, w plus those two angles that I've just worked out is going to equal to 180 because there's a triangle here. And the tri angles in a triangle add up to 180. So obviously, I'm speaking as quickly as I can, but you may need to rewatch parts of this if necessary. Okay, so quickly working this out, we have distributing the bracket, we've got 180 minus x minus y. And then we also have 180 minus x minus y, because it's the same thing, giving us w plus 360 minus 2x minus 2y equals to 180, remember, because all of these angles add up to a triangle, w plus those two angles I just worked out. Taking away 180 from both sides and moving the 2x and 2y to the other side, we've got w plus 180 equals 2x plus 2y. And therefore moving the w to the, sorry, isolating the w, you get w equals 2x plus 2y minus 180. I think I said over 180. Anyway, that would be A. Obviously really quite hard to explain in the limited amount of time. You may need to rewatch that a couple times. Wait, was it 2x plus 2y minus? Yeah, 2x plus 2y minus 180. At this point in the real test, I'd probably check to see if I've made mistakes, or maybe i just come back to it anyway. Let's go on to the next one, because these questions are getting harder, so I need more time. This one, yay, data interpretation. The graph above shows the total sales in millions of dollars for three companies, A, B, and C. Cool, total sales, millions of dollars, nice in a particular sector for the years 1998 through 2007. When was this question written? It's old. Okay, assume these companies are the only three companies active in this sector. Companies A and B existed since the 1980s, although only data from 1997, 1998 is shown. Company C's first year in existence was 2000. Ah, so that graph starts at 2000, cool. Company C was responsible for approximately what percent of total sales in the sector in 2007? Well, company C in 2007, 120 from the graph. If you look at company C, the triangle, and that's 120. And then the total is plus the other two guys, which I think are 32 and 20. And we have, so the total is 120 plus 32. That's company B plus 20, that's company A. So the total is 172 and company C is 120. So 120 divided by 172, which is 70% roughly. Cool. Next one. Same caption. From 2002 to 2003, company C had what percent increase? So 2002, it was 50, and 2003, it was 110. So it's difference over original. That difference there is 60, 60 over the original. 60 over the original of 50 is going to give us 1.2, so 120% increase. Ooh, okay, let me check that. It's going to be 112, but maybe I rounded it a bit. Double check that. From 2002, company C is a triangle. Oh, it was 52 maybe, from 52 to 110. Okay, so the difference was 58. So in 1998, we just had company B on about five and company A on 82. So that's 87 in total. And then in 2007, we had a lot, didn't we? We had 172, I did that earlier. 120 plus 32 plus 20, yeah, 172. So it went from 87 to 172. So we find the difference there. The difference is 85, 85 over the original of 87, so it increased by about 98% or 100%. Yeah, the others are sufficiently far away that I'm not going to think about 72 or 153. Okay.
Sounds reasonable. Choose the option that best answers the question. The point zero zero, and then all these other ones form a triangle. Okay. If angle ABC equals 90, what is the area of the triangle? ABC equals 90. What is the area of the triangle? I might need a diagram for this. I think I know what trick they're doing. So we've got, hard to display this actually, I'm gonna to have to write it off screen and then show you. So we've got zero, zero for A and zero for A minus five. So that's a height of four A minus five. Because it's directly vertical because the X coordinate is the same. The X coordinate is also zero. So it's directly vertical from A. And then C, you've got in some random position of 2a plus 1 and 2a plus 6. 2a plus 1, 2a plus 6. Now I can show you what I'm drawing, which is a triangle with a straight vertical on one side. That could be the base, for example. And then the height is 2a plus 6. Ah, except they said... Angle ABC is 90. Ah, that changes everything. ABC is 90. Wow. So if ABC is, if that angle is 90, that means this is actually a straight line. And if that is actually a straight line, then the Y coordinate of B is the same as the Y coordinate of C. Because a 90 degree angle here in a triangle means this is a straight line. So we have 4A minus 5 equals 2A plus 6. Then they want you to solve that. So take away 2a from both sides, add 5 to both sides. So a equals 5.5. And how do we find the area of this triangle? Well, of course, base times height divided by 2. The base is 4a minus 5. And we know a is 5.5, don't forget. So 4 times 5.5 is 22. 22 minus 5 is 17. So that base is 17. Now the height is this y coordinate. No, 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 sorry, this x coordinate. So we've gone from a zero x coordinate all the way across to this one, the 2a plus 1. Again, we know a is 5.5. So 2 times 5.5 is 11 plus 1 is 12. So the, the height, thinking horizontally, is 12. 17 times 12 divided by 2. I can do that in my head. That's 102. That was a hard one. That was a really hard one. I don't blame you if you might want to rewatch that. That was pretty hard. Consider each of the choices separately and select all that apply. For which value of x is that less than zero? Really? <laughs> they just want me to hammer in here. Okay, well, in a sense, if we rearrange that, we could just pick numbers or pick the answers. But if we push the one fifth to the other side, we get this. So for that to be less than a fifth, well, Let's see, basically the bottom line will have to be bigger than five times or more than five times bigger than the top line. Then we know the fraction is less than a fifth. Because a fifth, the denominator, five, is exactly five times bigger than the numerator. But if the denominator is say six times or seven times bigger than the numerator, then it's a smaller fraction. So that's what I'm checking out. Putting 10 in, we have 30 over 120. And that is only four times bigger. So that's not right. Putting 11 in, that's probably a shortcut here. Putting 11 in, we get 33. Helps to know your square numbers off by heart. 121 plus 22. So 143. 121 plus 22. 133. 143. <laughs> Whoops. 121 plus 22. Wow. 143. Okay. So that is that. Probably shouldn't use my head as much. 4.3. So we're slowly getting bigger. But it's not quick enough. So I'm going to skip 12 and go to 13. So 13 squared, 169. People said knowing these numbers isn't helpful. 169 plus 2 times 13, which is 26. So the bottom line is 195. The top line is 3 times 13, which is 39. Now, is that 5 times bigger? It's exactly 5 times bigger, but it's not less than a fifth. So 13's out. I think all the others are going to be the correct answer. I can just demonstrate that by doing, say, 14. 14 squared, 196. Told you it's good to know these off by heart. Plus 2 times 14 is 28. 
to watch my x minutes video and divide by 42 which is 3 times 14 and that is 5.3 so you can see that it's the denominator is more than five times bigger than the numerator so the fraction is less than a fifth and it's just going to get worse and worse with 15 and 16 so i believe that's the answer moving on given that x is a positive integer such that x is greater than 75 or equal to which of the following is the remainder when q is divided by six hmm i would just pick numbers here I would start with 75, honestly, this is above my head, times by 75, so 75 cubed, minus 75, actually, I think I know a shortcut here, so n's in zero, and when we divide that by six, it goes in perfectly, so zero remainder, and then I would try another number though, it probably is a shortcut here, I know I'm being a bit silly but picking numbers helps me out if I ever get stressed in the test just pick numbers take away 76 divide by 6 again no remainder so answer 0 let's try another one I'm kind of paranoid I know it's going to end in and then divide by 6 no remainder it's too big of a coincidence so I think this must be always 0 I know I could factor out the x and then do difference of two squares. So x times x plus one, x minus one. So it's three numbers in a row. And therefore, ah, that's the fancy way of doing it. I'm gonna quickly show you. I don't have time to do this. So I'm gonna show you anyway. You could factorize and get that. And then factorize again, x plus one, x minus one, difference of two squares. So I've done a video, most important quant formula you need to know, so check it out. Anyway, this is three numbers in a row got x minus 1, x, and x plus 1. That's three numbers in a row. And any three numbers in a row have to be divisible by 6 because one of them is going to be even and one of them is going to be a multiple of 3. And if we have a multiple of 3 and an even number, it's definitely, when we times it, divisible by 6. So no remainder. Anyway, didn't really have time for that, but <laughs> did it anyway. Choose the option that best answers the question. The hypotenuse of a right triangle is 16 foot longer than the length of the shorter leg. If the area of the triangle is exactly 120, what is the length of the hypotenuse? So they said that the hypotenuse is 16 feet longer than the length of the shorter leg. So we've got x as the shorter leg and the hypotenuse is x plus 16. If the area of the triangle is exactly 120 foot, so we don't know this one, unfortunately, we call that y. So x times y over two equals 120. So x times y equals 240. Okay, and then obviously we've also got Pythagoras. What is the length of the hypotenuse in feet? Hmm, I could do Pythagoras, obviously, x squared plus y squared equals x plus 16 squared. And sub that in, ah, actually, Okay, maybe we could do it because if we square this other side out, we get x squared plus 32x plus um, 256. Take away x squared from both sides. So y squared equals 32x. No, this is not going to help. Hmm. x times y is 240. Well, at this point, I'd probably pick numbers. I'd be like, if the hypotenuse is 26, that means the shorter side would be 10. The x would be 10, because it's 16 less than that. And if x is 10, y would have to be uh, 24. And 24 times 10 divided by 2 is 120. So what's wrong with that? Oh, is that a right triangle? 20, sorry, that's 10 and 24. 10 and 24 and 26, that is a perfect triangle. So it is A. I just picked numbers. I could have done the other ones. I could have tried 32. 32 and then this would be 16. And 240 divided by 16 is 15. So Y would have been 15. 
but then 15 squared plus 16 squared is not 32 squared. So 225 plus 25, I'm just proving how it's not answer B. That is not 32 squared. So basically I tested numbers and I got lucky because the first one I tested worked out perfectly. That is a right angle triangle. It does follow Pythagoras. 10 squared plus 24 squared does equal 26 squared. Because I knew that because of the Pythagorean triple. 5, 12, 13, double that, 10, 24, 26. Okay, so I got a bit lucky there by picking numbers. I'm sure there was a better way of doing it, but I couldn't see it. Okay, next one. When the decimal point of a positive number n is moved two places to the left, the result is equal to the equation is equal to that. What is the value of n? Well, if you move the decimal point two places to the left, you're making the number 100 times smaller. So basically they're saying n over 100, that's moving the decimal place two to the left, equals 6 over n minus 1, equals 6 over n minus 1. Always be paranoid, check I wrote that down. Yeah, 6 divided by n minus 1. Now I just need to solve that equation, cross multiply. So n squared minus n equals 600. Move that across, so n squared minus n minus 600 equals 0. And now I need two numbers that multiply to get 600 and add to get minus 1. Okay. Or 25, because 25 squared is 625 minus 25 is 600. Okay, so it's 25. I just guessed numbers at this point. I was like, what number is near to 600 squared? And I was like, it's not 30, that'd be 900. It's not 20, that'd be 400. So I was like, 25, 25 squared, knowing your squares off by heart. 25 squared is 625. 65 minus 25 minus 600 does equal zero. So n is 25. And there you go. That was kind of hard. I kind of did a shortcut there, just picking numbers. How else would I have done it? I'd have used two numbers that times together to get... I actually don't know how, how I would have done that with picking numbers, so I have to check it out afterwards. Okay, I think this is the last quant question. This university has two kinds of professors, academic professor, professional, sorry. At this university, 60% of the professors are academic, 70% are tenured. 90% of the professors are academic, tenured or both. Oh, that's confusing. Tree diagram, I think. Tree diagram. Okay, I have to do it slightly off screen. Um, got academic and professional. And then it said that 60% are academic. 60% are academic. So 60% academic, and then immediately fill in that 40% therefore are professional. And it said 70% of the professors are tenured. So 70% overall are tenured. If 90% of the professors are academic or tenured or both. Oh my God, they're tricking me in the middle of a question. Now they're bringing Venn diagrams into it because they're talking about all being both. So suddenly we have to switch to a Venn diagram because they use the word both. So we've got 60% being academic that's a terrible diagram. 60% being academic, 70% are tenured, and 90% is the total. So if we have, because it said 90% are academic, tenured, or both. So if we put x there, this is 60 minus x. Check out my video on Venn diagram, 70 minus x, and the total is 90. So 90 equals adding this all up. We have, I'll just show you the working out. Probably wouldn't do this in the test, I'd just skip over a little bit, but 130 minus x. So x equals, what is that, 40? So x is 40, so 40 are 40% 40 are both academic and tenured. X is 40, so that means that we have 40% of people who are academic and tenured. But we know there's 70% of people are tenured in total. So that means that 30% are 
must be professional and tenured. So 30% must be professional and tenured. So 30 plus 40 equals the total number of people tenured. And then the actual question is what percent of the professional professors are tenured? And we know that there are 40% from our tree diagram that we started with, 40% are professional, of which 30% are tenured. So 30 out of 40, 75%. Oh my God, that was hard. I don't know if there's a quick way of doing it. I'm sure there was, but I just use tree diagrams and Venn diagrams because of the word both. But wow, that was a hard question. I think that's the last quant. Yeah, that's the last quant. I'm not going to do verbal today because I want to see if people are interested in this kind of Magoosh interactive test and if they found it helpful or too hard, too easy, whatever. So I'm just going to stop there and then check my answers. I would say that it's slightly harder than the test that I did when I did it and got the 340, but I still felt most questions were answerable. That last one was particularly hard though, maybe even slightly harder than the real test would be. So I wouldn't want you to be too intimidated by this test, but I know a lot of you are interested in harder level questions under timed conditions. So I definitely think this test hit that mark. Either way, let's now go through the answers. I don't know if there's a quick way of doing this, but to go through question this one that was C that was easy Is there a way of just going next mm, to do it one by one so that circle question was yeah that was pretty easy they're the same thing and I'm gonna quickly pause the video open them all up and then show you each of them because otherwise it takes too much time okay I'm back so yeah that first question you just have to spot that they're the same circle this question, did I get D? Yes, I did, because we don't know what W is. This question, B, yes, because there were more even numbers from 42 to 92, because it starts and ends with an even number. This question, yes, A is bigger. You divide by 1.15, you don't take away 15%. This one, yes, because you don't start at four and end in six. Maybe I should have said that. Some people would have started at four and ended in six, but it didn't say they were integers. So we start at three and end in seven. Even though technically you're not allowed three and seven, you still start and end there just to check the boundaries. So starting and ending there, you get 14 to 54, and it can't include those numbers, but it could be anywhere in between. So that's why it was D. This one, they were equal. Yes, you divide by 1.25, you don't take away 25%. This one, yes, even though you don't know what probability A is, it has to be bigger than 0 0.6 because the probability of event B can't be any more than one and A times B is 0 0.6, so that's why. And damn, we come across my first mistake. And it says very hard, but I just made a silly mistake because I was trying to teach you about weighted averages. So I didn't actually check out the fact that we can't have any number between 20 and 23. Do you remember I did 21.5% and I said, well, it could be lower than that or higher than that. But the thing is, you can only have 23% of a certain number and it be an integer. You have to have an integer programmer. You can't have half a marketer. So you can only have 23% of the number 100 or the number 200. You can't have 23% of 99 or 23% of 101. So the number of marketers had to be 100 or 200, but it said there are some programmers, so it can't be 200. Meaning that there's 100 marketers and 100 programmers, so you can work it out. I rushed that one, I hold my hands up. That was silly. I know this trick, I've taught this trick many, many times. You can only have 23% of certain numbers like 23 percent of 100 or 200 etc if the answer needs to be an integer and so we could actually work out the number of marketers here classic mistake but in my defense i was trying to teach at the same time so i didn't really check that answer anyway next one let's see how many of these i get wrong this one we got that was just factorizing algebra i will put the link in the description of course so that you can check out your answers and they provide video explanations and text explanations for you to go through as well, so that would be great. This one, yes, going forward and backwards in the sequence, you get three, eight, and 38, that's fine. 
This one was hard. You just had to notice that the big triangle adds up to 180. So the bottom right angle is 180 minus X plus Y. And that, that was the same as another angle. And then you do the angles in a triangle add up to 180. That was hard. And you can rewind that one to watch it because I went quite fast, but I got it right. So that's fine. 70%, yes, that was fairly easy. C out of the total to get the percentage. This one was 112, yes, when you were more accurate, I got 120 the first time. Then we had this one, yes, 100%, I got that, even though it's slightly off, but I rounded it. This was really hard, you had to spot the whole 90 degree thing, meaning that it's a flat line, and if it's a flat line, the y coordinates are the same. So 4a minus 5 equals 2a plus 6, and then solve it. That was interesting and fun. This one was testing out numbers, but it was also noticing a pattern, noticing that to be less than a fifth, the denominator has to be more than five times the numerator. And also noticing a pattern among the answer choices as well, so that was okay. Very hard. I didn't think this was very hard, you just try numbers, and I tried three numbers and I got zero so every time as the remainder, so I just presumed it was zero. I did also prove the hard way though, by factoring out, but this, you could have just picked numbers. So I wouldn't call this very hard. This very hard, yeah, I agree this is very hard because I don't know how you, I'm interested to see how they did it. Did they pick numbers or no? Yeah, back solving, so they picked numbers like I did. And it also came down to that 5, 12, 13 triplet, which I'm not sure if I have done a video on Pythagorean triplets, maybe that's one for the future. But I did rely on that to quickly spot that A works out because you have 10, 24, and 26. And I knew that was a multiple of 5, 12, 13. So I'm not sure I have done a video on that. But maybe I should, because that was really helpful and that was very hard. Again, don't be intimidated if you didn't get all of these at all. I do think this is slightly harder than the real thing. People who have done the real thing can comment below and say if they felt this was harder or easier. I've done the real thing and I think this is harder. This one was fairly simple. Moving two places to the left, you have to notice that that means it's n over 100 and then solving the equation. The hard bit I think was solving it at the end actually. Actually this was hard because when you cross multiply, you get this equation here. And how do you solve this? It says we could do this algebraically, but let's think about this. We want two consecutive integers that have a product of 600. See, and then they get into prime factorizing. That's really hard. That's really hard. So a lot of people would have got to this stage and then run out of time. And the only reason I got it right is because when I multiplied it out and expanded it and brought it all to one side, I noticed that 600 was very close to 25 squared. And so I realized that it would work out. But if I hadn't spotted that, basically if I hadn't known a lot of these square numbers off by heart, like I talk about in some of the other videos, I would have run out of time for this question. So that really goes to show, I think, that this advice, I'm not just playing around, it really helped me out in the test. And then this one, wow, that was crazy. Blimey, that was a hard one. Yeah, I got it using a mix of Venn diagrams and tree diagrams, but I wanna see how they do it. Okay, so they use a table instead of a tree diagram, classic. And then they filled it in. Wow, how many rows has this got? 10, 30. Okay, well, actually this doesn't necessarily look that hard. So maybe if you guys read this, you might find it easier than my way. I just rely on Venn diagrams as soon as I see the word both. And I saw that we had 70% tenured, 60% academic, and 90% academic, tenured, or both. So it fits perfectly into a Venn diagram. Then I worked out that 40% were both, meaning that we have 40% who were academic and tenured. The question was asking about professional and tenured. So I realized that left 30% who were professional and tenured, 30 out of the 40 that are professional is 75% E. That's how I did it, but you guys might find this way better. So 19 out of 20, I'd say that's disappointing. I think I could have gotten 20 out of 20 because I teach that trick all the time about integer values. But you guys have to admit, I did also teach quite a lot of topics under the time pressure of doing a Magoosh test, which is famously hard. So if you found that helpful at all, please leave a comment, let me know. 
and I will do another one of these, maybe on the verbal.